Hi everyone and welcome to the Rights Cast. I'm Nancy Leong and my guest for today is Joanna Schwartz who is a professor of law at the UCLA School of Law where she teaches uh, both doctrinal and clinical classes related to civil rights and civil litigation. Joanna, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk today about your article, Police Indemnification, which was published in the NYU Law Review last year. And it's such an interesting and such a timely project, and I really appreciated the empirical approach that you took to examining the way police indemnification works. Um, before we start talking about some of the specific findings in your article, just for anyone who's watching who might be a little bit less familiar with the concept of police indemnification, what is that? What are, we, what are we talking about when we talk about police indemnification? So the article that you are uh, talking about is an examination of the extent to which individual police officers are personally financially responsible for settlements and judgments in lawsuits against them alleging police brutality uh, and other kinds of constitutional violations. So really what I was trying to understand was whether individual police officers pay money out of their own pockets when uh, there is a settlement in a case uh, in which they've been named as a defendant or a jury has found that they violated someone's constitutional rights. Uh, the, the notion of indemnification is uh, uh, that a city or a municipality, a county uh, or a state will pay those uh, settlement and judgment costs uh, on behalf of officers. So why would we have a situation where a city or a municipality or some other governmental entity would pay when a police officer has done something wrong? What's the logic behind that? So there's all sorts of employee-employer relationships uh, in which those employees don't pay the costs of settlements and judgments against them. You certainly can think about doctors um, who have insurance, uh, and so they don't actually bear the financial brunt of settlements and judgments in malpractice cases. And there's all sorts of other kinds of insurance agreements or um, employer-employee uh, agreements where those employees when they're doing work for, for someone else, do not pay the settlements and judgments in cases brought against them. And you can think about the same kinds of justifications that you would imagine in those other scenarios uh, operate with equal force in the policing context. Police officers are charged with enforcing the law um, on behalf of uh, cities and counties and state governments. And so when they violate uh, constitutional bounds, uh, the argument is that, that officers need to be financially protected um, so that they aren't bearing the brunt of those costs. We, uh, we through our um, yeah, elected officials, give police officers guns and tasers and handcuffs and the authority to arrest people and put them uh, under their control. And so I think the, the idea is that we as taxpayers and as, uh, as cities and counties bear some of the financial responsibility uh, when, those, um, when those powers result in injury to civilians. So it sounds like the background research that you were working from when you started this project suggested that police officers were usually indemnified but that there were some limitations on that. Was that consistent with what you found or did you find something different? I found something different. Uh, although prior research in the area had come to the conclusion that officers were generally indemnified, uh, they did also come to the conclusion that officers would likely not be indemnified for egregious misconduct, uh, for conduct uh, outside of the scope of their employment, and for punitive damages awarded against those officers, which are intended to, to punish those officers. The assumptions in prior uh, scholarly consideration of these questions was that officers wouldn't be indemnified in those areas. When I looked at the practices in 81 jurisdictions across the country over a six-year period, I found that officers truly were virtually always indemnified. They paid 
about uh, they paid 0.02% of the total dollars awarded to plaintiffs over that 6 year period and they contributed to just 0.4% of the lawsuits that were uh, resulted in payments to to plaintiff the police officers in that were represented by the the jurisdictions in my study did not contribute to settlements and judgments even in cases uh, in which officers were off duty cases in which officers engaged in sexual misconduct, cases where officers planted evidence, cases where officers ended up going to prison for their misconduct. There were 20 cases in my study uh, in which officers uh, were found to have engaged in malicious conduct such that a jury awarded punitive damages against them. And not one of the officers in those 20 cases actually paid a penny toward the punitive damages judgments that were entered against them. One of the things that I thought was really fascinating about your article is that you found that officers were sometimes indemnified even in situations where it appeared that the relevant state law would actually prohibit indemnification. Can you generalize about those situations at all and do you have any thoughts about why uh, governments are indemnifying police officers in situations where the relevant statute actually says that they don't necessarily have to. So I think that the, the instances in which cities and counties indemnified officers in violation of the applicable statutes really concerned cases in which punitive damages were awarded uh, against those officers. So there is the most variation in indemnification statutes as it relates to punitive damages. Uh, California, which is where several of the jurisdictions uh, and several of the 20 cases um, came from, uh, allows punitive damages to be indemnified and the determination is made by the governing body on a case-by-case -case basis. Albuquerque is the same way. Uh, but there are other jurisdictions um, like uh, uh, Las Vegas and uh, New York and Oklahoma City and Prince George's County that have statutes that seem on their face to prohibit indemnification of punitive damages awards. Uh, but in those instances, in those locations, officers were awarded, uh, punitive damages were awarded against officers and they, yet they still didn't pay. There were two different ways in which jurisdictions uh, those four jurisdictions dealt with this issue. One was sort of a, a workaround, meaning uh, the punitive damages award was entered against the officer. And then the jurisdiction and the plaintiff agreed to settle the case post-verdict and have the plaintiff agree to waive their uh, right to those punitive damages awards as part of the terms of that settlement. But there were also instances in New York and Prince George's County where the jurisdiction, the government appeared to pay the, the punitive damages judgment, satisfy the judgment in direct violation of governing law. So why do you think this might be happening? I think this is one example of a much larger phenomenon that relates to this indemnification research more generally, which is the relationship between law in the books and law on the ground. This research is a prime illustration of the way in which law on the ground can differ from law on the books. And in the jurisdictions in my study, there is wide variation uh, regarding when indemnification decisions are made, whether indemnification is uh, mandatory or discretionary, whether indemnification is prohibited in some instances, and yet there really was no variation in the outcome. Officers were always indemnified. And I think you can take from that the fact that the interests in indemnification uh, are, are really um, much deeper than what the statutes uh, require or prohibit or allow. And so the, the drive to and the inclination to indemnify officers for even what seems like truly egregious uh, misconduct is driven by forces that are, are stronger than the language in the statutes themselves. Do you think that those forces might include things like pressure from police unions or concern about recruiting officers, quality officers,
if something happens and an officer is personally liable as opposed to being indemnified or something else. I mean, when you talk about larger forces at play, what are some of the other things that you think might be going on here? No one was particularly forthcoming with information. Certainly, I didn't get any straight answers about why jurisdictions seem to be violating their own policies in uh, allowing indemnification in these instances. But from broader conversations, I would say that that there are concerns about recruiting and keeping officers. There's an interest in um, protecting officers, making them feel uh, that once they're they're hired, making them feel like they can vigorously enforce the law without the threat of liability. Uh, I do think that police unions are, are a powerful force protecting the interests of law enforcement. And I think that there's also an underlying skepticism or cynicism about lawsuits uh, and a sense that these suits may in some or many instances, probably depending on the perspective of who you speak to, uh, allege frivolous claims and so officers need to be protected against uh, those suits as well. This is speculation, uh, but those are some of the ideas that I have heard uh, articulated in one way or another during the course of my research. Since we're talking about the methodology that you used in the study, I'd love it if we could actually go into that a little bit more. So you mentioned earlier that you selected 81 different jurisdictions and tried to gather information from those jurisdictions about uh, the extent to which police officers were indemnified in situations where there was a settlement or a judgment entered against the officer. How did you select those jurisdictions? Um, what kind of questions did you ask them to get the information that you needed? Just tell us a little bit more about what went into this study. I can certainly imagine it was a lot of work. So, as I said, my goal was to understand whether officers contributed to settlements and judgments in cases alleging police misconduct. And I made the decision that it made sense to gather information from as many jurisdictions as I could uh, and not go, not go deep into a few jurisdictions but really try to get the picture in, in a lot of jurisdictions. So my first step was to look at the Bureau of Justice Statistics which sets out the 50 largest municipal police departments, city police departments, and the 50 largest county and state law enforcement agencies. Uh, and I took the, the two of those together uh, and they, they, some of them overlapped. The total was uh, 70 jurisdictions that fell within these two, the 50 largest municipal agencies and the 50 largest law enforcement agencies uh, in general. To those 70 law enforcement agencies, I sent the same public records request which was seeking information about the total number of cases that had been resolved with a payment to plaintiffs in police misconduct cases in a six-year period, and the number of instances in which punitive damages were awarded against officers in that six-year period, and the number of instances in which officers contributed to settlements and judgments, and the amount that they contributed. That public records request I sent to the police departments in those 70 jurisdictions and then began a long set of uh, emails and phone calls and letters between myself and those jurisdictions. Many of those jurisdictions, even if they were responsive to my request, the police departments themselves did not have the responsive information. So often the police department sent me to the city attorney's office uh, or another city agency, the city clerk. Uh, sometimes I had to resend the public records request and, and start all over again. But I got information from those 70, after about a year I got information from 44 of those 70 large departments. Then I gave a, a presentation about my paper uh, up at uh, UC Berkeley at, at Bolt Law School and got some great questions there uh, about whether the results that I had found would be reflective of practices in small and medium-sized jurisdictions. So I sent a second round of public records requests. I found 70 small to mid-sized jurisdictions that I selected randomly uh, around the country and 
submitted those same public records requests to those 70 small and mid-sized jurisdictions uh, and ended up with 37 uh, out of those 70 responding to me. In general, were the police departments and other government agencies that you spoke to, were they forthcoming with the information? Uh, were they reluctant to give you the information that you were looking for? I mean, I'm sure that it varied from one jurisdiction to another. Were there any patterns? As with many things in life, it seems, getting 80% of the information took 20% of the work, and it was the last 20% of the information that took 80% of the work. There were a number of jurisdictions that very quickly responded to my request and others that were much, much, much more difficult to get information from. Notably, the sheriff's departments, which are county agencies, were much quicker to give me information as a whole. And it was the municipal, the city departments, that were much more difficult to get the information from. Given a lot of the recent events that we've been reading about in the news, so the shooting of Michael Brown and the death of Eric Garner and the shooting of Tamir Rice and uh, Darian Hunt, there's definitely been a conversation recently in the national media about what should happen to the police officers who caused these events, if anything. And in particular, I know that um, in recent weeks, there's been a lot of discussion about what will happen to Officer Pantaleo, uh, who's the officer who was responsible for Eric Garner's death in Staten Island. So my understanding is that there's litigation pending, a civil suit brought against Officer Pantaleo and the city. Um, this is after a grand jury declined to indict Officer Pantaleo for um, any kind of criminal charge in the death of Eric Garner, but so I'm interested in um, the implications of your research for this civil suit that's going on right now. Let's suppose that there was some sort of verdict entered against Officer Pantaleo by the jury. Do you, do you think that this is a situation where the city would indemnify the officer, or is this a situation where he would end up paying out of pocket if, of course, he was found liable? Based on my research uh, regarding New York, it seems unlikely to me that he would not be indemnified. Uh, there, but there are 34 cases out of the many, many thousand in which the city of New York paid during the six-year period, where New York City required officers to contribute something to a settlement. New York. For, for all of the things that people criticize the New York Police Department about, in this regard, the NYPD is actually doing something, or the city of New York is actually doing something distinct uh, and something that I think makes sense, uh, which is to require some officers, in some instances, to contribute something to settlements in police misconduct suits. The numbers aren't that high. Uh, it's a, a couple of thousand of dollars um, in, in most cases. Uh, but my understanding, and this is not confirmed by New York City, is that when the New York City Comptroller's Office, which holds the purse strings for the city, participates in negotiations with uh, plaintiffs and the New York Police Department, in instances in which the NYPD has found that officers have violated policy, the comptroller, at least in, in past years, has pushed for a contribution by the officer individually. And so that's certainly a possibility in this case, uh, but it's, it's a small possibility. Uh, so there, there's a chance in New York that there would be some sort of financial contribution. Something that I think a lot of people are not entirely clear about is the way that different proceedings relate to one another. So for example, the way in the Eric Garner case, the way that the grand jury's refusal to indict Officer Pantaleo relates to a possible civil suit by his family against the officer and against the city, the way all of that relates to potential federal charges. With respect to indemnification, do you think that the outcome, for example, in the grand jury proceeding 
will have any effect on the likelihood of indemnification? Or do you think that these really are just completely separate proceedings that don't have any particular bearing on one another? I don't think they have a bearing in practice on one another. And I say that just simply because of the cases that I have looked at in which officers have been uh, charged criminally, in which officers have been convicted and sent to prison for many years and still were not required to pay anything, uh, to contribute anything to settlement or judgment in a lawsuit. There are other cases in New York, for example, where officers have been required to contribute and it doesn't appear that any disciplinary action has been taken against them, much less criminal action. So I don't think there's a clear rhyme or reason uh, that you, or a clear causal connection that you can make, or certainly that I can make with the evidence that I have about the criminal proceedings, whether to indict, uh, and the civil proceedings, whether to award money to the plaintiffs. Obviously, the Eric Garner case has received a lot of attention and a lot of scrutiny in the media, both um, the professional media and um, on blogs and on Twitter and on social media. To what extent, if any, do you think that this really unusual degree of publicity is going to affect the likelihood of indemnification in um, the Eric Garner case? Well, I think that political pressure is very powerful in general. I think that cities and elected officials uh, respond to political pressures, and there are no doubt significant political pressures in this case. As you can see with what's going on in New York, there are also extraordinarily strong political pressures for Mayor de Blasio and for the city of New York to stand up behind their officers. So at this moment, there seems to be a tremendous amount of pressure, political pressure, going in several different directions. If I had to guess, my guess is that he would not be required to contribute simply because there will be so much, so much attention paid if he is required to contribute. And so if the family does receive some sort of financial settlement and Officer Pantaleo isn't required to contribute, just to make this absolutely clear, where is the money coming from? The money is coming from New York City taxpayers. The city of New York pays settlements and judgments in police misconduct suits out of a general citywide fund. And that fund is paid for by the taxpayers. Uh, police departments are not income generating entities for the most part. They get their money from the city or the county that employs or that, that, uh, that uh, for which they, they provide services. And those cities and counties satisfy settlements and judgments or pay the money in those cases. Another case that's been in the news a lot recently is the one in which Tamir Rice who was 12 years old was shot by a police officer while he was playing in a park with a toy gun. And this was in Cleveland. Now, was Cleveland one of the cities in your, in your study? Cleveland was one of the cities in my study, and it's actually one of the three of the 81 jurisdictions where I confirmed there was a requirement that officers contribute to settlements. Uh, there were two cases in Cleveland during the six-year period uh, in which officers were required to contribute, and they were both uh, excessive force cases. Do you have any thoughts about the officer who was involved in the Tamir Rice shooting? Um, I mean, there, there, there are a lot of background facts that don't really look that good for the officer. For example, he had been all but terminated from a prior police department. He had applied unsuccessfully for jobs with other police departments. There was a report in his file that apparently the Cleveland police were unaware about, but there is a report in his file from a previous job that described him as, um, I'm slightly paraphrasing here, but described him as a terrible shot, um, emotionally distraught, things like that. Perhaps that speaks more to the likelihood that there will be a judgment entered directly against the municipality itself or something like that. But I wonder whether, I wonder whether any of these factors affect the likelihood, uh, in your view, 
that the officer will be indemnified, or are there other factors that you think will affect the likelihood of indemnification here? Well, I certainly agree with your point that those factors, to me, point toward the incompetence by the city of Cleveland and the Cleveland mm -hmm. Police Department. <clears throat> A sensible screening process for police hires, particularly those who have worked other departments, would be a rigorous assessment of their performance in those other jurisdictions. Uh, so I do think that that evidence goes very strongly towards in, in deliberate indifference uh, or negligence by the city and the police department itself. It does also go toward uh, liability and suggestion of knowing misconduct by the officer. Perhaps it could play into a punitive damages judgment. But whether it has an impact on indemnification, who's to say? I do want to add one, one thing, though, also that I want to make sure that I say, which is that there are, there are values to indemnification. The assumption might be that police indemnification, if police officers are indemnified, this is an injustice to society. Uh, but if police officers are not indemnified, if police officers have to pay settlements and judgments out of their own pockets, there are going to be a lot of plaintiffs who are not made whole. Tamir Rice and any number of the other high-profile cases that have happened recently could well result in settlements or judgments in the seven figures. And very few police officers have the kind of money uh, that would be necessary to satisfy those settlements or judgments. So I don't know that in that getting rid of police indemnification altogether is the right way to go uh, if you're thinking about achieving justice. I think that's correct and thank you for bringing that point out. I mean I think that when we look holistically at the types of remedies that are available to plaintiffs, on the one hand it may seem unfair if you just look narrowly at the officer that the officer doesn't have to pay out of his own pocket but then if you think about making the family whole or compensating them in an adequate way adequate way for their for their loss then the funds that are available exclusively from a police officer may not be sufficient and in that situation while it may not be ideal to reach into the city's funds that come from the taxpayers it may be the best of the available alternatives in my ideal world officers more officers would have to do what the relatively small handful of officers in the New York Police Department have been required to do, which is to contribute something to settlements and judgments uh, in instances in which they have been found to, to engage in some wrongdoing. And that kind of approach, you can argue and, and consider how many cases that should be and how much the contribution should be, but that kind of model does create some financial penalty and financial incentives to the officer while also making plaintiffs whole. Were you surprised by the results that you found? I know that you said that you expected to find that police officers were usually indemnified, but what you found is so much more than that. You found that police officers are virtually always indemnified, even in situations where there's some kind of really egregious misconduct or punitive damages or the officer um, goes to goes to prison for some amount of time. Was this surprising to you? And if so, you know, what what were some of the most surprising things about it? I certainly thought that officers were usually indemnified, but I was surprised by some of the most egregious cases that I found. A case out of the Albuquerque Police Department where an officer responding to a domestic disturbance call, uh, took a woman in his car and raped her. Uh, and then there was a finding after an investigation that he had raped her and sexually assaulted multiple other women um, and uh, taken improper custody of a couple of boys. He was uh, convicted, sent to prison for many years. The woman uh, brought a civil rights suit and $875,000 in punitive damages were awarded against that officer, and he paid nothing. He was indemnified by the city of Albuquerque that had fired him and sent him to jail for many years, uh, were willing 
uh, to pay the punitive damages judgment on his behalf. Uh, there was another case out of the city of Atlanta where officers uh, executed a warrant at the incorrect home. It was a, an elderly woman who lived there who ended up passing away as a, as a result of the, the anxiety and, and uh, disruptiveness of the search. It was found that officers planted drugs in the residence and lied, and those officers also went to uh, prison. And as part of their criminal sentence, they were required to pay something like $8,000, which was the cost of funeral expenses for this woman. Uh, but in the civil suit, they weren't required to contribute anything uh, uh, toward the resolution of the case. So I was surprised by the extremity of the cases that I found. I was also surprised to find the same result across so many jurisdictions uh, despite the size of the jurisdictions, despite the policies in effect in the jurisdictions. So both of those things were surprises to me. I think this research is so fascinating because what you found really runs contrary to a lot of what's been accepted as true in civil rights litigation for decades. So just to give an example, the doctrine of qualified immunity says that as long as an officer was behaving reasonably, even if he violated someone's constitutional rights, then that person can't recover money damages from the officer. And one reason that's given as justification for the doctrine of qualified immunity is simply that we don't want officers to be bankrupted. We don't want them to be subjected to crippling financial liability uh, just for making a mistake in the course of doing a really difficult job. But it seems like from your findings about indemnification that that's actually not true of qualified immunity. Um, would you agree that uh, your findings undermine some of the assumptions that the Supreme Court has made about qualified immunity? And if so, um, what kind of modifications to the doctrine do you think might be appropriate here? I absolutely do. The Supreme Court's qualified immunity doctrine, which as you said, protects officers even if they violated plaintiff's constitutional rights so long as the, the right wasn't clearly established and there's a whole convoluted way in which the court has said that uh, lower courts are supposed to, to figure that out. Qualified immunity doctrine, that protection for officers, is premised in significant part on the desire to protect officers from the threats of financial liability. And the Supreme Court has assumed that officers will, people will not apply to become officers, and that officers once on the job won't vigorously enforce the law because they're afraid of uh, being uh, named a defendant in a lawsuit. To the extent that those concerns uh, are that, uh, or beliefs, assumptions are that officers fears about personal financial liability is what might uh, over deter them. This research really, really undermines that assumption. Officers really don't have financial skin in the game in these cases. Uh, and there's other arguments, though, made about justifications for qualified immunity, like that um, officers are, are going to have to spend a lot of time in uh, dealing with these suits and that they're a hassle even if there's not financial liability or that there are other negative ramifications even if not liability. And that still needs to be assessed, but given that officers aren't spending their own money in these cases, I do think it undermines a significant justification for qualified immunity. There was a recent Supreme Court decision that said that private prison guards are not entitled to qualified immunity, meaning private prison guards can be sued, uh, and if they are found to have violated the, the Constitution, they are liable. And one of the justifications that the Supreme Court offered for treating private prison guards different from police officers was that private prison guards have the protection of insurance, and so they're not financially responsible for those settlements and judgments and cases. My research shows that law enforcement officers are as protected and insulated from financial exposure as private prison guards. So to my mind, the justification that the courts have offered to um, not have qualified immunity for private prison guards applies equally in the context of law enforcement officers.
So I'm interested in how indemnification affects the interactions between the parties prior to trial. So for example, is this something that the defense attorney who's representing a police officer or a municipality might bring up prior to trial? Um, is this something that a plaintiff's lawyer might bring up? How does indemnification come into play um, before the trial happens, if at all? So one of the most interesting things I found in my research was that even though officers are virtually always indemnified, the issue of indemnification plays a significant role throughout the litigation process. And specifically, government lawyers, lawyers representing these defendant officers, use the threat that they will deny indemnification to their strategic advantage throughout the litigation. I've found many instances in which uh, the officer's attorneys would threaten that an officer would not be indemnified as a way of getting settlement leverage before trial. During trial, uh, there is, if an officer uh, might be uh, exposed to punitive damages, there uh, can be testimony by that individual officer about his own finances, about mortgages or child support payments that he must pay. And the jury is allowed to consider those costs and liabilities when figuring out whether to award punitive damages against the officer. And defense attorneys put on that evidence, even in instances in which they indemnified those officers for punitive damages verdicts after trial. I also found instances in which punitive damages were awarded against officers, and defense attorneys filed motions with the court seeking to reduce those punitive damages verdicts in part because it would be a financial burden to those officers to satisfy those punitive damages verdicts. In many of those instances, the punitive damages verdicts were reduced, and then after they were reduced, the city indemnified the officer for those punitive damages awards. So the threat of, in, of denying indemnification is used in the doctrine, in qualified immunity doctrine, and additionally, in these uh, litigation discussions throughout the litigation process as a means of making it more difficult for plaintiffs to prevail and to prevail fully in their claims against the police. So at least in theory, your research suggests that this is not a, a tool that should be available to defense attorneys or at the very least um, that many of the times when it's brought up, it's something of an empty threat. Correct. It's my strong belief that if there is a trial and there is a punitive damages phase of trial, that defense attorneys should not be allowed to introduce testimony and evidence about an officer's financial resources unless the plaintiff's attorney is given equal uh, ability to conduct discovery about the prevalence of indemnification and introduce evidence to the jury about the likelihood of indemnification. To my mind, if a officer and, and his or her attorney uh, has introduced evidence about their personal finances, that's opened the door to the question of whether that officer will actually have to personally satisfy a punitive damages verdict against him or her. Well, and this is where perhaps your research could be very useful, right? I mean, since you've gathered together all of this data, um, if an attorney in a particular jurisdiction um, has access to it, then perhaps it's something that could be really useful um, both prior to trial and uh, during the trial itself. I hope so. And I've spoken to uh, judges um, at the Ninth Circuit Judicial Conference and to many plaintiffs' attorneys bringing these cases uh, and am very happy to serve as a resource to anyone who is interested in thinking about and litigating these issues. Well, Joanna, thank you so much. This has been a really interesting and really timely conversation, and I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and just talk about this interesting research that you've been doing. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for your interest, and, uh, and I look forward to, to watching your uh, show moving forward. And for anybody who is interested in learning more about Joanna or Joanna's other research or who's interested in learning more about police indemnification more generally, take a look at the links below the video um, for more information about all of that. This has been the RightsCast. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.